in the land of Mordor, in the fires of Mount Doom, the Dark Lord Sauron forged in secret a master ring to control all others. And into this ring, he poured his cruelty, his malice, and his will to dominate all life. Now, the power of the returning ring lures a chain of evildoers to Sauron's side. Sauron is the Dark Lord. Darkness, darkness, wherever he goes. The fate of the world will soon be decided. The dominion of evil grows even stronger. There is a union now between the two towers. Barador, fortress of the Dark Lord Sauron, and Orthanc, stronghold of the wizard Saruman. At one end you have the intensity and the all-encompassing power, the feudal lord of Sauron. But then Saruman considers himself to be able to control all evil. Whom do you serve? Saruman. Sauron's allegiance to the Dark Lord Sauron requires a grotesque army and a traitorous agent. You can't help but be terribly smug about that. Brad Dourif is Wormtongue, Sauron's mole in the Rohan court. Saruman corrupts Wormtongue. He teaches Wormtongue to sap the king's energy till the king is old and feeble and can't even see what's going on in front of him. He is virtually a zombie. Well, there's no real Theoden there, eaten away by the poison of Saruman, put there by Wormtongue. It's kind of funny, it's like, if you spot the bad guy, <laughs> but, you know, you've got all these people with beautiful, beautiful blonde hair and stuff, and then there's this sort of... <laughs> it's like, would it be him? <laughs> Here we go now, and roll sound. He is making Rohan weak so it will fall to Sarah. The power of Isengard is at your command, Sauron, Lord of the Earth. Finding an actor to play Saruman was very difficult because he has to have enormous strength and wisdom, but he also has to have a, a sort of an, an arrogance and a contempt. And to do that, it has to be an actor who is not acting powerful, but has that inherent authority in their stature and their voice. One of the halflings carries something of great value. Bring them to me alive and unspoiled. One of the great things about Christopher Lee, too, is that he is a huge Tolkien fan. Um, probably one of the biggest Tolkien fans that I've ever met. He, he's read Lord of the Rings every year. He reads it once a year and has done so for decades. He actually met Professor Tolkien once. He's met his sons. He has a huge love of the books, and so I never had to really talk to him about who and what Saruman was. He just absolutely knows his character inside out. You did not seriously think that a hobbit could contend with the will of Sauron. There are none who can. We must join with Sauron. The character, he is an evil person, but with enormous charm. <laughs> Everybody asks me from all over the world is how do you feel about it in the film? And I say, this is the very spirit and essence of Tolkien. The sound designer really comes up with the sounds for all the, the animals and the whole natural environment that makes up the world of the film. The 
ones where you sort of hear, you can actually hear the human quality of the scream are good. Part of our sort of philosophy behind the sounds in this film was to have the sound effects really be as naturalistic as possible. And part of that involves recording sounds in, you know, outdoor natural spaces as opposed to in a studio. And that's been a little difficult in Wellington because it's a small, compact place and it's noisy. So it's tough to find outdoor spaces where you don't have airplanes and cars and people and all that. So there's actually a cemetery just outside of Wellington where we've been going to do a lot of recording. And we have to go there at night because during the daytime you have cicadas and they don't quiet down until the sun goes down. So we've been doing a lot of sort of recording of swords and um, bow and arrow and screaming in the cemetery. And we've had to um, repeatedly like phone up the police in the area and say, we want to do some recording there tonight. So can you warn all the neighbors that if they hear screaming coming from the cemetery, it's just us. The dead marshes are an environment that lend themselves to incorporating a lot of different vocal elements because it's really this place where all the ghosts of the elves and the other people who have fought in these battles from the past, their souls are sort of trapped in the marshes. And so what we've done in terms of the design is all the sounds that we hear are vocal based. Again, it's these sort of like mud bubbles percolating up that are whispering. So we can have sort of vocal whispers and things that are turned into bubbles, turned into wind, turned into you know, different sort of mud, slurpy, sloshy elements. And then at certain points, as Frodo starts to be put into this trance, he's hearing the voices of these souls trapped in the dead marshes. The whole environment is infused with these voices. And at certain points, they come more to the forefront and really start to suck you in. The general sort of philosophy with battles is that we really want to sort of focus on what's happening right in front of our faces in the foreground, but we want to feel sort of the mass, the crowds with these huge sort of epic scale battles. And so it's this constant balance between how do you get the size and power without having too many sounds starting to cancel each other out. So it's about finding the right details to bring out front that really have the most impact and letting everything else fade a little bit into the background. For us as sound people, you know, we can feel really good about our work when it's not really noticed, when it is seamless. And it functions in a way where it supports the, the emotional content of a scene without drawing attention to itself. How many? 10,000 strong. Let them come. Film two, uh, as Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli go on their journey to um, rescue Merry and Pippin, they come across the Rohans, and they have to cross the Rohans' lands. The Rohirrim, the race of people of Rohan, have lived in stoic isolation for a very long time. They don't really know that much about alliances, don't have faith in that anymore. We head north! Yeah! They're very staunch warriors. They have uh, great character, strong, sort of fearless um, warriors with long spears on fast horses. Highly romantic stuff. The Rohan kingdom has a very dangerous weapon, which it is an incredibly well-trained and powerful cavalry. They're all cavalry riders. They live on plains, and they are horsemen. And if you have an army, a cavalry is everything and they've survived a long time on their own merits, their strength, their cleverness, their bravery, and their horsemanship, and their pride, above all. It feels like you're stepping back into a slightly earlier period with the Rohirrim, and um, 
It's quite interesting, really, because it feels like the, the fellowship do go on a journey backwards in time to a certain extent. The location for Edoras was, to me, one of the most beautiful, the most impressive. I mean, it was exactly what you would dream, you would hope that Edoras would look like and feel like. It has the, the plains and then it's the rocky outcrop in the middle with Edoras standing on top of it and even down to the silver stream running through. It's just amazing. Every little thing that's in the film is a work of art. It's beautiful. The people there that were working on this thing had all knew the books, like the back of their hands, and all of them respected the depth of the world that Tolkien had created. We had to put in a kilometre and a half of road up the side of a mountain uh, with a couple of bridges over these rivers, and we encountered winds of up to 180 kilometres an hour. What was interesting about it is the whole thing is a bloody wind tunnel, because you've got these two mountain ranges, if you like, fairly close together, and a, a crag in top. And the wind used to belt down there, you know. The rawness of the land, the fact that we found locations that had a lot of grass, a lot of straw, meant that they probably would have had thatched roofs. It was a huge project. I think they spent eight months building it. And it was the first real place that I shot, and it was great to actually start in my home and just have this solid, huge building around me, the Golden Hall, and to be standing out the front of that, it was breathtaking. Tolkien drew a lot of his inspiration for the Rohirrim from his knowledge of, of Anglo-Saxon culture and the Beowulf, that wonderful epic poem in which there is this hall which resembles very closely, I think, the, the Golden Hall. Lots of, you know, wooden beams, um, horse motifs all around. Obviously lots of, you know, gold, golden fixtures, intricate designs on the floor, and the um, stonework on the floor, the masonry, you know, had interesting patterns and motifs, you know, right the way through it. And sort of in the middle of it, there's this central fire pit, and the king sits you know, right at the end of the hall, right opposite the door, and uh, from there, that's where he yeah, holds court. You know, everything was constructed for the movie on this knoll on this little hill. There was a majesty to that location, a secret valley. It seemed a very lonely place, but when we were there, of course, full of life with all the amenities of a modern film being made. And action! And we only shot there for three weeks, and then they dismantled it. And if you go back to the valley now, which will take you about an hour and a half from the main road, uh, you'll find no evidence that uh, there was ever a film made there. The set has gone, the, the, the service roads that led up over this rocky outcrop have gone, and uh, now it's just uh, the sheep uh, and the wind. This, the shelves here are a mixture of um, final designs and preliminary Ones, you know. The design process for any of these digital creatures starts in the design team which is based in Richard Taylor's Weather Workshop and they'll work up sketches and then maquettes, physical models, until they get an approved physical design. The wags are very closely aligned to a mix of a bear-wolf-hyena hybrid. Their eyes are placed well out on the edges of their skull, so they've got incredible vision all round. The orcs like to think that they control these creatures, but like a badly broken in horse, these things are maniacal beyond belief, and they're barely kept on the very edge of control. The wargs in the film are wolves plus a lot. Big, slobbering, nasty predators who these guys are riding around on, you know? But that shows you how tough the orcs are. <laughs> Peter described the orcs as being dock workers, these hardened, grisly-looking, almost schoolyard bully types that had bad acne when they were kids and got a real chip about it, and now they were basically pissed off and ready to go to war. So we wanted to create an immense variety of these characters. We've got the Moria orcs, and we theorized that they had never seen the light of day, and therefore their eyes have expanded to this massive size to try and take in as what little light is around. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
And then once again, in contrast, are of course the Urukai. These characters are malicious and maniacal beyond belief. Their singular focus is to find the ring, to beat the enemy. Really the kind of silverback gorillas of the movie, you know, they're at the top of the food chain, bred by Saruman. He developed this other race, this kind of monster master race, which is the Urukai, who don't tire who have no feelings, who are not scared of death. We've never actually seen what uh, Mrs. Orc looks like, but I'd uh, hate to go to visiting for tea. The Oliphants were done how we do all of our creatures, which is taking them from a design maquette to building the model, fitting the model with the skeleton, building a muscle rig around the skeleton that will drive the flesh and then texturing them and lighting them into the scene. The additional element on the Oliphants are they carry these big towers with traveling Harad. The Mamakil is going to be a really neat creature to see. They are gigantic. I believe 10 stories tall. They differ from an elephant. If you put them side by side, you'd see the scale differences, like the head smaller, the tusks, you know, obviously there's multiple tusks. They're much, much bigger than elephants. The Black Riders have dispensed of their horse land-bound creatures that they've tortured into submission and replaced them with the fell beast. These massive winged creatures, almost bat-like and serpentine, that live up in the highest reaches of the Barador uh, ramparts. If you think riding a warg is tough, you could try to sit on one of these babies, because it's like, it's like a brontosaurus with wings. It's so easy to take a dragon and put such small wings on it that it would be unfeasible that it could ever fly. But in the process of creating something like the Fell Beast, it's got wings the size of a 747 Jumbo, because that's what it would physically need to get that body form off the ground. It's like those big beetles that you see, those stag beetles. They're fine, they're okay on the ground, you can deal with them on the ground. But when you see one of them coming in with its wings out and its horns out, I mean, coming in like a bloody Boeing jet at you, you know, like nose height, I mean, it's quite terrifying. Everybody's riding something different. No roller skates, no mopeds. This is like, you know, you get a big, unwieldy animal and you slap a saddle on it and you go to town. And that's sort of how they did it in Middle Earth, I guess. I come back to you now, at the turn of the tide. It's a great delight and surprise, I think, as you turn the pages to realize that Gandalf is back. But it's a changed Gandalf. He has been almost literally reborn, brought back as not Gandalf the Grey now, but Gandalf the White. That's one up in the Order of Wizards. He's a battling commander. And <laughs> Gandalf's preferred mode of transport is a horse called Shadowfax, who is so clever and obedient that uh, he, he doesn't have a bridle or a bit or reins or a saddle. Do not look for welcome here. His job is to help the creatures of Middle-earth survive and resist the mighty changes that Sauron will wield uh, if, if he becomes all-powerful. The veiling shadow that glowers in the east takes shape. There is a union now between the two towers, Orthanc and Babadur. His job is not over. He's sent back with a, a focus uh, and a new dedication and uncertainty about what has to be done. Sauron is not so mighty yet that he's above fear. He fears you, Aragorn. He fears what you may become. It's very exciting when Gandalf and uh, Aragorn and the elf and the dwarf arrive at Edras to find the human king, Theoden. The courtesy of your hall is somewhat lessened of late, Theoden King. He's not welcome. And it's the awakening of Theoden, the restoration of his capabilities and his youth, thanks to a bit of magic by uh, 
the wizard Gandalf. Keep your forked tongue behind your teeth. I have not passed through fire and death to bandy crooked words with a witless worm. The whole uh, excitement of the story cranks up to another gear with the arrival of uh, those characters. This is but a taste of the terror that Saruman will unleash. You must fight. There will be no war for men. I will not risk open war. Open war is upon you, whether you would risk it or not. It is an army bred for a single purpose, to destroy the world of men. When we've created the props, the costumes, the armor that appear in a film, we've been very much aware of the history and cultures of the people that wear the particular costume or use the particular sword that we're making. Every army in the film has its own specific weaponry. It's all pre-firearm sort of thing, so it's all swords and bucklers and shields and bows and arrows. You know, elves are all right. They can handle a bow and arrow, but when it comes to close quarter work, you need an axe. We went to great lengths, hand-beating the armor out of plate steel exactly as it had been done in the medieval era cooking it up in huge furnaces, beating it out on anvils. And when buckles, for example, were being made for the orcs, I made it very clear that these guys were not allowed to weld anything. You're not allowed to weld it because that's too easy. And that will lead you down paths and into shapes which are not right for the period and for what you're trying to portray. So they ended up doing a lot of heat welding, which is a difficult process because you've got to get two pieces of metal to the right temperature, hit them very hard, and they're one piece. The swords being hand ground out of plate spring steel. The hilts and crossbars um, cast up out of the lost wax casting, exactly how our forefathers would have done it themselves. And in the process, what we were trying to achieve in doing this was making sure that the physics of the manufacturing complemented very closely that which was available 500 years ago. Stun swords routinely break because, you know, when you hit them, the shock waves comes down and they snap out of their hilt. Um, and Richard Taylor, not because, you know, he necessarily wanted to, he was forced to innovate because he couldn't afford to make five stun swords per actor per day. It just would have been absolutely prohibitive. So he sort of completely invented a way to put polyurethane, which is kind of skateboard wheel rubber, into the hilts of these swords so that when the shock wave of contact hit the blade, it would travel down the blade to the hilt and be absorbed into the polyurethane that was hidden under the leather and stitching of the hilts. And we didn't break one stunt sword, which has to be some kind of record. We went for, say, in the case of the Gondorians, a very ceremonial, almost Roman-like armor, as opposed to, say, the Rohan, who are almost minute men. They're ready to go at the slightest call to action. They roam the Riddermark. They're ready to take upon any foe that would come into their lands. What business does an elf, a man, and a dwarf have in the Ritter Mark? Speak quickly. Rohan, the weapons of choice, uh, when they're on horseback, uh, they have a long spear, a shield. The spear is typically used as a first strike weapon, and they use the shield as a weapon as well. And action! Well, my abiding memory of this damn picture is being halfway up a mountain and looking down and seeing Two members of the wardrobe department struggling up the hill with a hamper with the remainder of my costume in it. And behind them, two men from the armory department struggling up the hill with a hamper with my arms and axes and belts and things like that. And then a poor girl stumbling up the hill carrying my helmet and another one stumbling up the hill carrying my boots. And they put it on me and 70 pounds later, there I am, fully dressed, and now Peter Jackson says, Right, John, now I want you to run up the hill. And I run up the hill. Three days of night's pursuit. No food, no rest, and 
no sign of our quarry, but what fair rock can tell? That's my vision of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> what was that? Oh. And cut. Okay. You made me think that a man shouldn't be out of breath after running that short distance. <laughs> Try it with a 60 pound pack. <laughs> The Two Towers, I suppose, culminates with the sequence that is the, the battle for Helm's Deep. You must lead the people to Helm's Deep. By order of the king, the city must empty. They retreat from Edoras into Helm's Deep and are attacked by um, thousands and thousands of Urukai. And it's a big heroic battle at Helm's Deep. It was quite a cold and unforgiving location, quite horrible to be in when it's raining, and really you can sort of see why the Rohan chose Helm's Deep as the last stand, because, you know, it's, it's easy to defend. There's only one way the enemy can come at you, and you're backed in against the mountain, and consequently that's the great stage for a very fierce, prolonged battle. This place was built for this purpose. This is where we've always gone and we've always beaten our enemies because we've worn them down. No one's ever breached the deeping wall. No one's ever come through the Holmberg. Brace the gate! We use every trick we have uh, to stage that battle. Three, two, one, action! In the process of Helm's Deep itself, shooting that for months, Night shoots, just constant hardship. The stunt guys gave everything. It was the most amazing experience I've ever had as far as working with a, with a team. Helm's Deep, which was three and a half months of night shoots, was, that was the maker and break of certain people. I actually remember this one great moment where we were uh, shooting, it was uh, like two in the morning, and the Urukai extras were standing out in the cold. And uh, you know, here we'd been shooting for weeks and weeks and weeks, and uh, to get through the night uh, while they were waiting for the cameras to roll, they just started singing songs. We would have maybe 80 guys and a, and a few, you know, quite a few women are there as well, just singing along, trying to be as quiet as we could for shooting and stuff. And there's just this sort of feeling that without everyone together, it sort of couldn't be done. There's a lot of love. You want to do it this other side? <laughs> I was trying to figure out at some point about two thirds of the way through the, the whole shoot of The Lord of the Rings, the trilogy, how many times I had killed certain stunt players in their different incarnations, including all takes and so forth. And I know that I killed each stunt person at least 50 times. You know, I went past that at a certain point and I just stopped counting because it was ridiculous. You're just swinging and mowing all these elves' heads off and cutting them in half sort of thing. Your pair are just looking at you and just kill, kill. I mean, they, they only know one thing and that's hatred. A hatred so pure that it relieves them of any other considerations. They're slaves to Sauron's will in that sense. They're perfect, they're perfect fighters. It's a climactic moment, you know, for the Fellowship and for Middle Earth, but what is really telling is how it is fought, how people pull together against really overwhelming odds. And, uh, you know, that makes for exciting uh, storytelling. I mean, I hated it, I enjoyed it, I uh, will always remember it, and, uh, you know, I'm honored to have been part of that group that shot that sort of movie unto itself. <laughs> I think one of the biggest challenges with the Two Towers is bringing the character of Gollum to life. Action! 
Gollum is groundbreaking because he's not only CGI, but he actually is a performance-based character. He's not comic relief. He's not sort of an antic. He really is a major dramatic character. So we cast this wonderful British actor called Andy Serkis very early on. He was very much in control of the character, and I don't think that's ever been done on the film before. Wicked crazy fish. He has a schizophrenic kind of personality. Um, the Gollum side and the Smeagol. Smeagol is the younger, naive character he was before he became corrupted by the ring. And Gollum's been suppressing that like a, like a kind of an abusive parent, really. He's, he's the survivor and he's kind of knuckled him down. They will cheat you, hurt you, lie. Master's my friend. You don't have any friends. Nobody likes you. As far as the design goes, we referenced a lot of facial from Andy Serkis. We took a lot of his facial characteristics, the way he moves, the way his mouth moves, just his personality, and tried to put it into Gollum. So when Andy's doing expressions, and we have the same expressions being done by Gollum, they look like two kind of really weird twins. You're a liar and a thief. No. And you can see, you know, there's certain things that show up in the Gollum design that we really try to try to keep. You know, the squareness of Andy's lips, and Andy's very complimentary in saying that it looks like his dad. Bay's studied my face for two and a half years, poor soul. So Bay, well done. And uh, but, but he but he's come up with a whole range of emotional templates for the animators to use. Where would you be without me, Willem? Willem, I saved us. It was me. We survived. Because of me! And what you actually will finally see on screen is going to be a lot of Andy Serkis. And action! We would shoot the scenes with Sean and Elijah and Andy. We would then paint Andy out, so we had an empty background where he used to be. We would then have Andy basically replicate the scene, play the scene a second time, but this time in a very carefully controlled motion capture stage. And he'd basically be recreating his performance with the motion capture suit on. I wear a motion capture suit, which has reflective dots carefully positioned at all the joints, which are picked up by uh, 25 cameras going, going all the way around the studio. And the Gollum puppet moves in real time to my movements. And then his movements and his facial expressions, his performance, become essentially a computer puppet that the animators are able to use as a guide to animate Gollum in the most realistic way possible. And then obviously Andy Serkis will provide the Gollum's voice later. My it's a tour de force balance of Randy Cook and the entire digital team and Peter Jackson's vision and of an actor who is willing to give himself body, mind, and soul to the, to the part. I think when you see the movie, Gollum's performance is totally on par with Serene McKellen or Vigo or Elijah, totally on par with that. He's holding his own in very esteemed company in our movie. And it really is because we based it totally on Andy. And then we had incredibly skillful animators who were able to then take everything that Andy did and manipulate it into what we ultimately see as this computer-generated character.